yes ma'am okay can you do a facial cutaneous flap also yes ma'am we can do a facial cutaneous flap also uh huh how uh perforator based facio cutaneous flaps ma'am either thoraco acromial perforator thoraco dorsal perforators or any perforators on the lateral chest wall see a parascapular flap also you need not necessarily go till the perforator what is the parascapular supply it is based on uh, uh, circumflex scapular uh, branch ma'am which branch Uh, the dis uh, descending. So that's branch. the descending branch. Yes. Okay. So you have to take it, and you don't need to dissect up till the vessel. You can easily lift it, and you can fill it into the apex of the axilla. Yes. But if you want to do a perforator based flap, then you have to locate the perforator, and then you have to do any other perforator based flap. Thoraco dorsal or thoraco. Yeah, T dap. You can do the T dap. You can use that perforator if you find it. You can get a. Uh, flap and you can propel it into the axilla yes ma'am okay yes ma'am uh, all right supposing this child had uh, got contracture of the neck along with the axilla even the neck was burnt and the neck was also contracted yes ma'am so can you do both the things simultaneously uh, no ma'am i would like to do first i would like to first manage the contracture of the neck and then go for scapula why the neck first why not the axilla first uh, because the uh, splintage would be a problem ma'am because in uh, after release of the shoulder uh, pvc of the axilla we need to keep the shoulder in abduction of at least 90 to 120 degrees and okay. after release of the neck we'll have to keep it in extension so simultaneously having both the positions will be a problem yeah. and uh, secondly for anesthetic uh, purposes also if we go for the release of pvc neck first uh, it will be easier for the anesthesia for the next procedure so it is always advisable to do the neck first and then go ahead and do the axilla in the second stage yes, not simultaneously because of your positioning yes ma'am okay so uh, what is a bipedical release can you do a bipedical release in this uh bipedical release in this patient uh, uh, because uh, otherwise called scar bridge uh, yes ma'am but in this patient um, in this patient you be able to do it no uh, you will not be able to do uh, it because you have to open the you will not be able to open the axilla uh, yes ma'am join because uh, it is the chest is at, uh, almost adherent to the upper arm yes, otherwise a bipedical release uh, does it have any advantage over an incisional release uh bipedical release uh, we can uh, uh, uh actually what is the advantage of doing a bipedical release there won't be uh, requ the requirement of ssd will be less in a bipedical uh, scar release ma'am okay Manage and what else then we can reconstruct with the tissues that are present locally the uh, rather than a graft we are uh, interposing with uh, the tissue that is present there so yeah so you are leaving a paddle of skin even if it is scarred over the area and you are grafting on either side yes, okay so over the joint if you leave that skin paddle yes, it is going to act like a flap so it you can avoid using again the splint for a long time because if you just put a graft you will have to splint that area wherever you have released the contracture for how long Uh, for uh, for uh, a grafting patient, you have to minimum give the splint for six months, ma'am. Out of which three months he has to uh, minimum uh, use the splint morning and evening, twenty four hours, and three months we can advise him for night splintage. Yeah, and uh, you may even have to continue the night splint for some time. But if you are doing a bipedical release, you need not give a splint for a long duration. Yes, ma'am. As soon as the graft is taken up, you can up uh, uh, the patient may. Uh, stop using the splint 
and the graft on either side is going to contract and it's going to expand that intervening segment of skin yes okay yes, so uh, you can avoid that that is the advantage yes, okay uh, anything else that you can do if you want to avoid uh, uh, not in this particular case because the entire surrounding skin is scarred but supposing the uh, surrounding skin is not scarred uh, anything else you can do if you want to avoid uh, uh, extensive grafting uh, we can do uh, tissue expansion also ma'am and uh, we can use that in in the second stage procedure yeah so you can use that expanded skin and use that to uh, uh, get a flap which you can put in that area okay that is another option yes ma'am and uh, what is uh, uh, what kind of graft would you like to use i think that question was asked uh, ma'am i would like to take a intermediate thickness split thick, uh, split thickness graft why not a full thickness graft uh, because uh, we ha- uh, there will be lot large area that needs to be grafted here if uh, mm-hmm. if the flap is not sufficient okay so and you the- want to avoid taking too much too large or full thickness graft yes ma'am right yes, and ma'am. what is the disadvantage of uh, using a thick split thickness graft in this particular patient uh, the tape might not be good ma'am and uh, why not you mean to say that a full thickness graft even if it's a big one is going to have a better take than a, a split thickness graft no ma'am uh, i told the opposite if we are taking a large full thickness graft Uh, yeah might- no what i'm saying is the disadvantage of using a split thickness graft for resurfacing the defect uh, uh in split thickness graft there might be uh, first of all other problems ma'am like uh, there might be loss of graft that will be there then uh, there might be because uh, splintage and yeah, taken up well any other disadvantage of a split thickness skin graft after it has taken up recontracture will be there ma'am Uh, yes, so recontracture uh, chances will be there because the child it's a the patient is a child he's going to grow so mm-hmm. as he grows will the split thickness graft grow no ma'am what will grow uh the flap will be there that that if we use a flap it will grow and uh, a full thickness graft will be like uh, used yes that also has a tendency to grow so your chances of recontracture will be much less yes ma'am. okay but more if the child if you're using a split thickness graft all yes. right so uh, what is the uh, primary contraction and secondary contraction ma'am uh, primary contracture is uh, due to the dermal no 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 i said primary contraction and secondary contraction mm. so primary contracture is uh, is the inherent property of uh, a graft which Occurs immediately after harvesting. Harvesting, ma'am. It occurs due okay. to the elastic recoil because of the elastin fibers that are present. Uh, the, uh, okay. This is more commonly seen in the full thickness graft. Secondary mm-hmm. contraction is after the wound bed has healed. Like it is the contracture of the wound bed. It occurs mm-hmm. due to the myofibroblast. So uh, this is uh, seen more in uh, when we have uh, resurfaced the area with a uh, uh, with thickness graft. So then, if it is the wound bed which is contracting, then it is immaterial whether you put a split thickness graft or a full thickness graft. Um, or is there a difference? The dermal component uh, in full thickness graft will uh, help in reducing that ma'am the contraction. What contraction? how does it do that uh uh because uh, uh, in full thickness graft there will be thicker dermis so the uh so what does that thicker dermis do the take will be even and better ma'am and uh, uh, take of a full thickness graft is worse than a split thickness graft especially if you take a bigger amount uh, so what is what does that thick dermis do the collagen uh, so the thicker dermis in the full thickness is going to uh, uh, inhibit the differentiation of the myofibroblast the secondary contraction is due to myofibroblast myofibroblast in the wound bed that's what you said so when you put a full thickness graft the entire dermis 
that you are putting is going to inhibit that. But okay. in a split thickness, where the dermal thickness is less, so the wound bed secondary contraction will still take place. Yes, ma'am. All right. Then what is primary contracture and what is secondary contracture? Uh, primary. In an axilla, in an axilla, what do you, where, when will you say that there is a secondary contracture also? Uh, primary contracture or intrinsic contracture is the contracture that occurs due to at the site of insult, ma'am. Uh, mm. And the secondary or external <laughs> contracture is the surrounding tissues that are uh, affected because of the uh, primary contracture. Yeah, so the, in case of an axillary contracture, what other tissues can be affected? What other areas can be affected? Uh, lateral chest wall can be affected, the medial side of the arm. Uh, what are so, the important structures? Especially if it's a female it's patient. A female. Breast. Breast. Uh, so there can be an associated breast contractor, which may be just a secondary contractor. The moment you release the axilla, you will be able to get it back into place. Yes, the nipple areola complex in a male patient may be uh, deviated okay. because of this. Okay. So yes. that is what you have to keep it in mind. Um, all right. I think, uh, madam, should we continue? I, uh, or uh, I think we've asked. Uh, I'll see if any doubts are there uh -huh. in the chat box. Yeah, there's a there's a doubt that has come up in the chat box. Um, Dr. Sudhir Navidia has asked this. Ma'am, can you explain the difference in darting and fishtailing once again, please? Yeah, see, fishtailing is done at the end of the incision. Okay, so you have to take your incision till the neutral line, and then you have to uh, give a angle, uh, sixty degree angle, uh, two incisions, which becomes like a fishtail. When you open it, it becomes like a fishtail. Now, darting is done all or all over the incision. When you give the incision, wherever you feel that there is a contracture band, you give a vertical slit there. So that you will have to give at multiple places. Wherever you feel that there is a contracture band, fibrous band underlying the skin, you give a dart. You keep giving incisions and then you feed the graft in all these multiple released darts. That is the uh, main difference. So many people don't do a fish tailing. They give multiple darts and they break the straight line of the graft by giving the darts. Yeah. Is there any advantage uh, no when compared these two procedures? Uh, see, many, many, many a times when we are doing an incisional release, uh, see, uh, fish tailing we generally give most of the times we have to give it. But many a times you find that there is still a contracture band in that uh, uh, the superior and the in, uh, inferior edge of the defect. So then you may have to give a dart to break that band of uh, the fibrous band. Uh, like a 360 would, degrees uh, release of the scar. Yeah, especially when you are doing a neck release, you may yeah. have to give a few darts in between. Okay. And uh, I would like to know one more doubt, ma'am. Uh, in any web-like contracture across the thing, you use multiple jet plasties or square flap, or like minor degrees of this. Yeah, if there is a... Uh, no, ma'am, uh, let me complete. Uh, there is a copula that is a dome is not involved and anterior web which is formed. If it is a supple and the two layers are uh, uh, like, like separate, uh, we can uh, move it. So can we take that copy extension of that anterior web for uh, covering the axilla part posterior after release of the posterior layer? Yeah, that is what I told in this particular case because the cupola is normal. We can give a incisional release yeah, on the posterior yes. side and yes. advance this posteriorly. Posterior. At the same time, breaking that contracture band which is coming in the inferior edge of the cupola. Okay. Because that also needs to be, it's like a trapdoor. Yes. So if we don't yes. release it now in this sitting only, then later on that will create problems because it will give a contracted look. So okay. that is all that I'm saying that you release it posteriorly like a yes. Y, and you close it like a V, yes. Y to V. Yeah, madam. Actually, a lot of interesting questions. Um, how long should uh, this is Dr. Nishant has asked this question? How long should we continue splintage? Role of serial splintage pre op? See, pre op or post op? Pre op. 
pre-op splinted, see, when the scar is immature, it is very important to use. If you feel that your scar is immature, okay. Now, that was another thing that generally we don't release contracture. Varnika, is she there? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, should you yeah, release it in the immature phase? Should you wait for it to mature? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we should wait for it to mature, ma'am, because from the second to fourth month of healing, there will be increased cellular activity, and that is where the collagen and myofibroblast deposition will happen. So, if we uh, give incision and graft at that time, complete healing won't occur. There, the, there will be like recontract. Would you say that complete healing will occur? Some other term you should use. Uh, there will be recontracture happening. Yes, chances of recontracture are there because already the bed of the wound is in a contractile phase. So it is bound to lead to a secondary contracture. It will continue contracting. And secondly, an immature scar is very uh, hyperemic. So it's going to bleed a lot. So your graft take might be affected. So we generally wait for the scar to mature. Now, till such time that the scar is immature, it is advisable to use a splint so that it does not contract more. Because it is in an active phase of contraction, so it does help if you use some kind of pressure garment or splint. You may not be able to use a pressure garment for an axilla, but for an elbow uh, or upper arm area, you can use a pressure garment, you can use a splintage, which will avoid it from getting more severe. That is the advantage of using it preoperatively. And postoperatively, if you are doing a graft and without a flap, then the patient will be needing a splint. Yeah, uh, Madam. Uh, next question is by Dr. Firoz. How long after uh, split thickness skin graft can we again harvest a second uh, uh, split thickness graft from the same site? See, uh, that is mainly used for uh, patients who for who we take up for tangential excision. For contracture releases, you generally don't need to harvest from the same site. But if you're doing uh, it's an extensive burn and you're taking up the patient for tangential excision in two to three stages. Then you can re-harvest after 15 days to three weeks. You can re-harvest that area because it epithelizes. So after three weeks, you can easily take another graph from that area. But otherwise, in a contracture patient, if anyways, you give minimum three months time. So you can harvest it if it is not hypertrophic. If you have taken a thin graft in the first stage only, then you will be able to take uh, another graft from the same area, same donor area. But uh, otherwise, in a contracture release, generally we take thick drops. So it may be hypertrophied and you may not be able to take a drop. But if you're doing a tangential excision, we take thin drops. So then we can do another uh, uh, three weeks and then take another uh, drop from the way. Yes, madam. Uh, Madhavi has asked this question. Madam, uh, will splinting be required in the case of an incisional release only? Will? Uh, uh, splintage be required if you do only an incisional release? Yes, splintage will be required if you are doing an incisional release. If over the joint area you are not giving a lap and you just put a graft, then that graft, as we just discussed, is bound to uh, contract again. So you do need a splintage. Yeah. That is the advantage uh, of giving a lap. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Rohit has asked this question. Ma'am, plane of uh, the tissue expansion on the back rate of success because this, uh, of thicker skin? See, in the uh, back, you will have to put it under the subcutaneous tissue, over the muscle fascia. That is the plane where you put the expander. Yeah, And, uh, and it is a thicker skin. Yeah. But for the difficulty in lying on the back, I think it gives a good... Uh, Patient has uh, to lay down laterally. Laterally, it gives a good... Uh, get a good so you, you, can, you can put it on the... You the nape of the neck also, Sandeep. Yeah. Some, uh, because the back skin is a little thicker, you can try. If you see the picture which you are showing, in fact, the two expanders were uh, placed in the back, exactly yeah. in the middle of the back. So that is a thicker skin. So mm. if you want to use a little thinner skin, you can go a little higher up, and maybe um, um, you can use the superficial cervical artery based flaps. You can use that will be a little thinner. Yeah, but or else you can put it on the upper arm also. Yeah, upper arm also. Yeah. yeah. Either of those two areas. Yeah, Joseph has asked this question. Are medial arm flap and posterior arm flap the same? If there is severe neck contracture, can we do a release even if the 
scar is immature see uh, neck contracture is one uh, condition wherein you may have to do a release in the immature scar phase yes. because it's a very debilitating contracture and it is causing a very severe functional restriction so many a times or i should say most of the times neck contracture is released in the immature phase because we have to restore the function so uh, in that case if you find that it is bleeding a lot and you are not able to achieve a proper hemostasis you can procure a graft and then you can do a dressing and put the graft later on in a second stage after maybe 2 3 days or 5 days time when it granulates otherwise you have pottery now you can use a cutting pottery to give the incision you can use uh, local um, uh, adrenaline solution and you can achieve a proper hemostasis and do the grafting for a neck neck we should not delay it for a very long time and yeah uh, other uh, than neck uh, the ectropion and the hand also comes into that category isn't it man uh, uh, yes and least. second is the head so there are certain conditions wherein you don't wait for the scar to mature first and foremost most important is the ectropion of the eye yeah. then is the neck and then is the hand contracture so we don't wait for the scars to mature unless and until it is a Uh, it is not a very severely hypertrophic scar, and if the architecture of the hand and uh, this thing is not being affected, you may wait for the scar to mature. You may give splintage, but otherwise you will have to release it if you want to avoid the deformity from worsening. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, Madam, role of physiotherapy in pre-operative period. That's by Dr. Uh, Mahalakshmi. Uh, yeah, pre-operatively, it is very important. You must advise the patient. Uh, proper massage with some oil any emollient or oil and pressure garments and splintage because all these things and the different range of exercises which the patient can do because all these things are going to help the scar to mature faster and the faster your scar matures and then when you do the release the chances of recontracture will uh, reduce because you're not going to excise the entire scar if you are doing an incisional release and there is scarring uh, of both sides or four sides of the area uh, it is uh, bound to and if it's immature it is going to continue contracting but if you give the pressure garments and all the supportive things then you can help the area to mature faster and uh, yes. also uh, post operatively patient has to continue doing the same thing so the patient gets used to it and is more uh, 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 i mean um, uh, compliant post operative yeah. and i think you have answered the next question also along with us from dr selvan now we'll go to the next question rohit he has asked ma'am how do we manage if there is a shortening of pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi muscles in long standing pbc axilla see if it is a long standing pbc axilla then uh, you may need a splintage which is a dynamic splint and uh, which you can keep opening so some people what they many a times what can be done is you release it and you may not be able to release it completely you generally re release it till about 100 100 110 degrees but if you're not able to do it then you can do a dressing of that area and you can give a dynamic spin which has a screw and you can keep opening it and continue that for a few weeks and once you achieve the full release then you can apply the graft on that area so you get a complete release that is yes. one way of doing it for a gradual stretching of the muscles yes madam uh, dr rakesh kumar has asked uh, another question uh, madam please guide on the surgical end points in axillary contracture a uh, surgical end point would be when you are doing a release you should be able to abduct the arm till about 100 110 degrees so that you don't hyper abduct it because if you hyper abduct it you are going to pull the brachial plexus so you should be able to get the arm into abduction till about 110 degrees and uh, uh, that if it is associated with a breast contracture then you should be able to get that into position as well uh i think and you should maintain the apex of the axilla if that is intact and uh, not displace the axilla because then later on when the axillary hair grow they look very unesthetic oh. if they are out of place so i think um, 
uh, this and then you have to release it till the subcutaneous tissue or till the muscle fascia muscle fascia preferably so that you can put the graft and the take of the graft is better uh, dr dipankar has asked this question uh, madam may i take this opportunity to ask you the exact mechanism of how pressure massage and silicon gel sheets help in treatment of hypertrophic scar okay so when you are giving a massage uh, you have to give it with pressure so there are different kinds of massage you can give massage just with the thumb pressure or you can give it with the fingers and you can uh, just do a simple massage like this or you can do rolling movements and you have to move from distal to proximal so that whatever edema fluid is getting accumulated or there is a lymphatic edema as happened in the first case wherein there is a circumferential uh, uh, scarring so that edema fluid starts getting drained so this is how the pressure is going to help in reduction of that edema and gradually uh, that will make the scar less edematous so it will become more supple and less hypertrophic then when you ask the patient to wear the pressure garments the pressure garments should give you a pressure such that it is about 25 mm of mercury above the capillary pressure so that again it is going to reduce the edema in the scar it can't be too tight because otherwise it will cause a obstruction of the arterial uh, flow but it should be sufficient enough to be above the capillary pressure so that it can allow the inflammatory edema and uh, this thing to settle and then that pressure also gives uh, hypoxia to that area so when there is an hypoxia what happens is that the collagenase activity the various factors which stimulate the collagen are going to come into play so that will help in the breakdown of the collagen and then again pressure will also help as it allows the maturation is going to allow the collagen bundles to get reorganized because initially they are all in a reticular kind of framework and later on they form bundles and parallel forms and that also allows the maturation to take place faster then uh, the uh, silicon gel sheet uh, 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 they say is um, that uh, when you apply the silicon gel sheet it uh, prevents the evaporation of the water so the trans epidermal water loss is going to get reduced so when the trans epidermal water loss is reduced it uh, inhibits the uh, um, what should i say the factors which are affecting the collagenase activity so uh, uh, when you are going to block that uh, the 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 collagen is no i said that the trans epidermal water loss is reduced so when that is reduced the factors which inhibit the collagen is are going to get uh, uh negated so the collagen is activity improves and that helps in the maturation of the scar then they also say that it also provides hypoxic environment then it uh, keeps the scar moist hydrated, and uh, hydrated. Uh, hydrated well hydrated so these are the various ways in which all these things are going to work yes uh, sangamitra has asked one question in case of bilateral axillary bilateral elbow and bilateral hand contracture uh, contractures what would be the order of release mm-hmm. so if there is uh, like we said we should always try and go from the center to the periphery except if your hand contractures are very severe you must deal with the hand contractor first otherwise if the hand contractor is not much it is minimum you do the axilla first and then you have to judge whether your hand can wait or not otherwise you do axilla elbow and then you do the hand you can't do the axilla and the hand simultaneously in all cases because if you need a flap cover on the hand then you can't mm-hmm. abduct the axilla and do the hand for a flap take it for a flap cover so in that case you do the hand first then do the axilla otherwise you do the axilla then the elbow and then the hand and then again you have to ask the patient one which side hand is dominant that is the most important feature and secondly you have to see which is a more severe contracture which is limited limiting the activity of the patient and which is going to worsen which we discussed in the hand and, and then uh, you have to do it one at a time if one there is no time. requirement of a flap for the hand can we go ahead with the, or releasing the all then the i time? i will do the axilla and the hand simultaneously i i mean we do that many a times so that we can avoid the ga yeah. if your flap requirement is not much you can do the axilla and you can do the hand simultaneously and then do the elbow yeah 
Later. Madam, in the bilateral uh, contracts of all the cases, like in what she had asked, can't we do it simultaneously, Madam? Both the sides. For both sides. Yeah. For oh. both sides becomes very difficult. If you do both the axilla simultaneously for the patient, he's going to be like this, <laughs> which is a very mm -hmm. uncomfortable position, and mm -hmm. um, uh, the patient is going to be dependent on someone else for uh, everything, mm -hmm. which is not possible. In a child, you may attempt it, but not in an adult. It is not advisable. Okay, I think uh, yeah, many people are thanking you. I think uh, <laughs> all the questions Sandeep, are done, madam. Yeah, Sandeep, I think madam has discussed most of the things. Only thing is, madam, do you use that McFarlane splint in children, madam? Children are uh, superficial burns still. What splint is that? Uh, that McFarlane splint or whatever it is, something like a Kramer wire splint, wire splint. Kramer wire we yeah. use in all our patients in the acute stage because acute we have stage. it is very cheap. And uh, it's only 100 rupees or 200 rupees for yeah. the Kramer wire. So it is very reasonable and we use it very often for our yeah. patients. But those who can afford it, it is not available in the hospital, then we use ready-made thermoplastic screens or the other now that uh, what, I, what I want to say is uh, the hand uh, mobilization, earlier they used to put a, something like a small, um, uh, w w what do you see, like uh, the coat hanger or something like that. They make it and then put the fingers into that. And then ask them to mobilize in superficial. No, we don't to use to, all that. No, no, no. Yeah. We don't do that. Always Nowadays, we are getting aquacel yeah. gloves. Aquacel gloves. So we yeah, put the hands in the gloves, and there is no mm. dressing over that. So if you don't yeah. do a dressing over that, the patient yeah, keeps can move, moving it. Moving. Elevate yeah. the limb and ask them to mobilize his fingers. Yeah, yeah. and most of the things, uh, Madam, has nicely and thoroughly discussed. Uh, the chat box, there was a question uh, somebody has asked. Posterior arm flap and medial arm flap, both of them are different. Posterior arm mm. flap is a flap which is yeah. based on the posterior midline of the arm, which is a branch from the brachial artery and uh, it supplies that. It's a cutaneous branch which supplies that. And it is a sensate flap, sensory flap, along with the cutaneous nerve, medial uh, brachial cutaneous nerve, you can take it and then you can use, utilize it. Medial arm flap, as we all know, it's a separate flap. Separate. So both are a uh, little separate. And uh, Madam has almost touched most of the uh, areas, and it was a nice discussion, Madam. And uh, Madam, you would like to quite, give any uh, guidelines? <laughs> yeah, and it like was very nice and informative. Or something like that? No, no. I think we have already discussed each and every thing. Guidelines for yeah. everything. It'll be just a repetition. Yeah. Most yeah, of madam. the things I think we've discussed. Yeah, discussed. I hope. And uh, threadbare, threadbare. Uh, it has been discussed. Hopefully, uh, there won't be any. Um, uh, Hello. Yeah. Uh, Rasa, you hear me? Yes, the guides of uh, the today's uh, PGs, if they wanted to contribute anything, uh, let them uh, tell Dr. Jagan Mohan and Dr. Subodh Kumar. Are they available? Uh, uh, JGM, sir. Sir. Thanks, sir. Thanks to sir. Dr. Sujata, madam, has given a complete overview of the entire upper limb surgery. Burn <laughs> surgery. There's nothing more to add. Yeah. Right from the axle art to the fingertips, she has described everything. And the PG should be very much grateful for this uh, complete discussion on the burn subject on the upper, upper limb. Thank you, madam. Well, I hope right, they don't have that. any problems in their exam. Yeah, and they're yeah. able yeah. to answer all the questions. Yeah. And, uh, if you are uh, an examiner also, they know the questions also well well before. <laughs> no, I can think of many more things. <laughs> so, but, but most of the, the many more most, things. most of the questions I think uh, you have discussed also, so they won't have any problems. I think uh, uh, it's a nice discussion. See, for an and examiner, it is, it is very easy to ask questions. Easy to ask, yeah. yeah. But we you should ask what is. Uh, we should ask a good examiner is one who asks what the students knows. So that I think most of the things you have discussed. Yeah, and, the and the, the, discussed. Basic, <laughs> yeah, the basic purpose yeah. is to find out how much the yeah. ex, uh, examinee knows yes. and rather yeah. than yes. what he doesn't know. What, yeah, and so uh, most of the things should, you have discussed. Yeah. And uh, Sujada, madam, uh, I can see on the chat box there's a diary of thank you for you, madam. This is, oh. I think, everyone has really enjoyed your talk. And they are all so thankful to you, including all Thank of us. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. Okay. I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Subodh wants to ask topic something. Is very simple, madam. The Subodh is online? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, so everybody has uh, doubts in that. Uh, so you cleared yeah. everything. Yeah, please, Dr. Subodh. Subodh sir. Good evening. Dr. Yeah. Subodh. Good evening to all. 
Uh, Good evening, sir. Today's discussion reminded me of my final exam in MCH. Dr. Bajaj and Karun Agarwal were the examiners, <laughs> and we had this same case: the difficult hand along with elbow and axilla contracture. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very good discussion. I think that was I... Dr. Bajaj was my guide, and hand was his favorite topic. Yeah, yeah he thoroughly mm -hmm. grilled. So us. our understanding comes from him. Yeah, both. Uh, yeah. Lakshmi what were you saying, Dr. Subhut? Both me and Lakshmi were the students then. Facing the same case, <laughs> we both appeared uh, together. Face okay. Dr. Uh, Bazaar and Dr. Karun sir. The uh, thing is, uh, we are little conservative while using uh, that plastics. We more okay. mostly go on to releases and uh, grafting. That is it. That which I wanted to communicate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The only okay. thing is that when you are using Z plasty for uh, scarred skin. If you give a Z, there is no problem. The only thing is you should not lift that uh, flap, scarred flap. Nothing will go wrong. As long as you don't lift it, you just leave it in its place, and it's going to lengthen that contracture. Thank you. Yeah, Even if it is not. Yeah. And I appreciate all of you for doing this. And uh, I have been attending on and off now and then, yeah. basically because we are into uh, duty in COVID. Uh, Exclusive COVID hospital, Khan. Okay. Okay. okay, Madam, thanks a lot once again. Thank you. Amidst your uh, tight schedules and other things, uh, with COVID and other things, also you'll be involved. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Now we are going <laughs> to start our routine OTs also. Routine OTs. We are doing okay. emergencies, but we are going to yeah. start routine from first. Yeah, we are also doing emergencies. Mm -hmm. Routines uh, probably we'll have to start it now sooner. So thanks a lot, madam. Thanks a lot for the nice discussion. Thank thanks you, Dr. Radha Krishnan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Lakshmi, and thanks, thank you, Dr. Dr. Sandeep. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank good you night. for all the. Thank you. Good night. Uh, and thanks for all the wonderful participation of the students also. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank, bye thank bye. you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay. Thanks.